Okay, good, good morning uh, in the United States, good afternoon in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, which tackles one of the most pressing issues of 2020 and 2021 and beyond, how to inoculate the world against COVID-19 and advance global health in the age of pandemics. This is an important issue for both the United States and the United Arab Emirates and an avenue for strengthening cooperation between the public and private sectors in both of our countries. Today, global health alongside climate change is arguably the main issue facing all of us. Pandemics, pandemics don't respond to borders and the onus is upon countries that can help to help. With the developed world beginning to recover from some of the worst effects of COVID-19 as vaccine distribution picks up, there remains an urgent need to inoculate the rest of the world against the ravages of the disease. There is a moral imperative to do so, but it is also in everyone's interest. The sooner COVID-19 is eradicated, the less likely new variants of the virus are to emerge that are more resistant to the existing vaccines, more contagious or more deadly. In that spirit, two entities have been formed to enact the UAE's global health goals, the Dubai Vaccine Logistics Alliance, and Abu Dhabi's HOPE Consortium. The Dubai Vaccine Logistics Alliance combines Emirates Sky Cargo's air network with DP World's extensive worldwide network of ports and logistics operators, along with the infrastructure of Dubai airports and international humanitarian city to distribute these vaccines. Worldwide, while Abu Dhabi's HOPE Consortium consists of Etihad Cargo's renowned air network Abu Dhabi Ports, Rafed, the healthcare purchasing arm of ADQ, and SkyCell to distribute vaccines and aid into the world. These two entities will play a key role in global vaccination efforts as the UAE's strategic geographic location and its excellent logistical capabilities will prove decisive in the battle against COVID. We could not be more delighted today to be joined on this virtual stage with leadership from these two entities, as well as the UAE Embassy in Washington, DC. Shamer Gargash, Deputy Chief of Mission at the UAE Embassy in Washington. Dennis Lister, Vice President Cargo Commercial Development at Emirates Sky Cargo, which is a central player in the Dubai Vaccine Logistics Alliance. And his colleague, Julian Such, Head of Global Sales Pharma, also at Emirates Sky Cargo. We're, we're uh, incredibly uh, pleased to be joined by Dr. Omar Najim, who's the Executive Director of the Department of Health Abu Dhabi, which is a leader in the HOPE Consortium, and Robert Sutton, Head of the Logistics Cluster at Abu Dhabi Ports, which is another key and critical important player in the HOPE Consortium. For this conversation, we are pleased to have almost 200 registered guests comprising business executives, government officials and thought leaders from the US and the UAE and the wider region, including Israel. This includes our friends and partners from the UAE Embassy in Washington DC and the UAE Consulate in New York City, as well as the US Embassy in Abu Dhabi and the US Consulate General in Dubai and the US State Department. Ladies and gentlemen, we also are joined on the webinar with journalists from the Wall Street Journal, Politico, Bloomberg and Khalij Times. I should note that this session is on the record. It is being live streamed and a video recording of the event will be posted on YouTube where it will be viewed by more people as well. Attendees, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you might have for the panelists. With that, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Ms. Shema Gargash, Deputy Chief of Mission at the UA Embassy in Washington, DC. Prior to her current position, Shema was the head of communications and public diplomacy for over two years at the embassy and a political analyst at the Congressional Affairs Division before that. Before her appointment to Washington, Ms. Gargash led the po policy division at the policy planning department at the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for three years. We count ourselves very fortunate at the Business Council to be able to work so closely with Shema and in the past and, and, and today, especially during this uh, crisis period. Uh, Shema, the floor is yours. We're honored to have you today. Please give us your remarks. Thank you. 
Thanks, Danny. Thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to see you, Danny, and an honor to speak alongside colleagues from Abu Dhabi in Dubai. I want to start by thanking the US UAE Business Councilor for convening this important discussion. I also want to recognize, recognize all of the Council's efforts to help strengthen ties and understanding between our two countries. Over the past year, I was proud to see how the government of the UAE took early and decisive measures to protect not only US UAE citizens and residents, but to also help other countries respond to COVID-19. The issue of less developed countries needing access to COVID vaccines is a critical one, and we all share a responsibility to address it. Through collaboration and consolidated resource planning, the UAE and other countries, NGOs and multilateral organizations are stepping in and taking actions to ensure we put the COVID pandemic behind us. Abu Dhabi's Hope Consortium and the Dubai Vaccine Logistics Alliance are two successful models of the UAE's collaborative response to the global From, uh, from our speakers, but let me give you a preview. My country's world-class logistics network, refrigerated storage capacity and central location as a transit hub combined to make the UAE an ideal location to organize and implement this effort. And by working with international partners like the World Health Organization and UNICEF, millions of doses have already been transported from the UAE to places that have the greatest needs across Africa, the Indian subcontinent, Asia, and Latin America. While my colleagues here today are the experts and will be able to go more in depth on their operations, the Dubai Vaccine Logistics Alliance and Abu Dhabi's Hope Consortium are excellent examples of what is possible when we come together on all fronts to work towards a common goal. I'm excited to be here and look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shema. Thank you so much. And also for your leadership uh, at the embassy during the last year, which has just been critical for all the assistance that you and Ambassador Al Teba and your whole team provided, not only to Emirati citizens that needed to get home to the UAE, but for US citizens that needed to get back to the United States. Thank you for all the work, the hard work that you did during this time to make everyone safe and secure. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. I'd like to turn the floor over to the representatives of the Dubai Vaccine Logistics Alliance first, Mr. Dennis Lister and Mr. Julian Such. Dennis is Dennis Lister is vice president, of, as I said, of cargo commercial development and UAE sales at Emirates Cargo, responsible for the Emirates product portfolio, portfolio and maximizing the commercial performance globally. In addition, he's responsible for the UAE market to lead the cargo commercial operations activities. He has been the driving force behind the launch of Emirates Delivers the first e-commerce specific product launched by Emirates Sky Cargo and is continually exploring ways to develop new opportunities and partnerships to enable sustainable growth and profit for the Emirates group. Julian Such is the head of global sales pharma at Emirates Sky Cargo. He is commercially responsible for Emirates Sky Cargo's global pharmaceutical division, having been appointed in August 2016. His last years have been spent specifically in pharmaceutical air freight, ensuring that forwarders and shippers in the pharma community have been understanding of the Emirates offering and what the requirements are. Without further ado, Dennis, the floor is yours to make your opening comments with Julian, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Shaima, for the, the introduction. I think just, to, you know, you, you touch on a very important point, Chima. you talk about helping other countries. And I think if you look at what we're doing here in terms of the DVLA, that is exactly the cornerstone of, of, of the model. And that's why we do what we do. I think before we get into the detail of that, maybe just to create some very quick context. And I think we kind of, we all understand that we are in this difficult position right now with this pandemic that's essentially brought the entire world and the economy to its knees. And as shame as you, as you raised the point, everyone has a part and responsibility in this, what we call is the, the fight, the COVID fight. 
we're all part of it. And I, I think if you look at the the end-to-end -end supply chain, every single link in that chain has a responsibility. Uh, I think to look forward, we have to look back. It is exactly a year this month when the Emirates airline uh, fleet was grounded completely, the passenger fleet. And I think that's a real big statement to think where we are now a year late and to see how things to develop. For us in the first 100 years of the fleet coming to a grinding halt, we within 100 days, we basically operated to 100 destinations. And that is key because I think something that cannot be underestimated is the critical supply chain. And if you look at the, the need for two key commodities that needs to continue to fly around the world, that's food and that's medicine. And that's something we continue to fly around the world today. To just give you an idea in terms of quantum and size, you're roughly talking about 650 tons of food is what we fly as Emirates today and about 250 tons of pharmaceuticals daily is what we fly around the world. So that's medicine and food around the world. So when the pandemic kicked in, you can imagine the huge impact with capacity being depleted from the entire network. It had such a massive impact. Um, a lot of businesses were brought to their knees as well, and a lot of airlines actually uh, had gone bankrupt as a result of this pandemic. So it's such an important topic, and even businesses to our audience and our listeners on the call can all resonate and fully understand and appreciate the impacts COVID has had worldwide. So for us, um, it was definitely a call to action. The leadership in Dubai said something we had to do very quickly was create this alliance and really using the strength of all the different entities we have in Dubai. And Danny's touched on those already. It's Dubai Airport, DP World, the International Humanitarian City and, and Emirates. It's really utilizing those capabilities and the strengths and the infrastructure we have to address very simply those developing countries. So if you look, if you fly uh, three hours out from Dubai, you hit two billion people. And that's what we think about that in terms of connecting those developing countries and ensuring that we get vaccines out to these people. So that's something that's really important for us. Something we've learned through the journey, and I'm sure Julian will touch on some of these points as well, is there are so many challenges that you don't anticipate until you hit with the pandemic. You have to learn very quickly and adapt fast. I mean, there were some things we did from an airline perspective in terms of the aircraft, using passenger aircraft to carry cargo, taking the seats out of the aircraft to make sure we get more in the main deck. There are so many components if we had more time, we could really go into a lot of detail, but it really just magnifies the importance of the continued lift that we provide as an airline. And if you look at the support structure we have in Dubai, as Danny reached out there already and mentioned, we have a great feed into the from a geographical perspective to hit those developing countries. So um, I'll leave you with maybe in the opening remark, just one, two final points. And um, one is, if you consider today there's already roughly 2 billion vaccines been distributed globally to the COVAX developing countries. That, that's for the normal viruses and various issues out in the world. That's not COVID specific. And then you look at what additionally needs to be sent out. There's an additional 2 billion on top of that needs to go to these developing countries. So the demand is double that of what currently goes into those developing countries today. So our responsibility to DVLA is to ensure that we continue to operate, to ensure that we break down these traditional silos and these barriers. I think we all have to be somehow uh, selfless and think of others and think about how we actually work together as partners to make this work. So from a Dubai government perspective and even UAE, we've all stepped up to ensure we make that work. And we've seen some great successes from that already. And I think just in closing, I, I think, you know, all of us as partners in the supply chain, basically, have to ensure that we get these wheels and gears of the economy moving again. Because for us, every day, every dollar, every vaccine counts. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Shaima. Dennis, thank you. Julian, uh, over to you. And if you could uh, say a few words also in your opening about the other partners uh, in, the, sure. in the Dubai initiative, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Just to move on a little bit more from what what, what Dennis was saying, get down into you know in, into some more detail. I think I think now um, with everything that's been said, you know we move 
large amounts of pharma every day. But however, the, the big thing of, of moving vaccines is they are more complicated to move than normal types of pharmaceuticals, especially given the cold chain and to the developing countries that we are going to. The infrastructure that is faced when we go to these developing countries, can it actually um, take that quantity of vaccines? So what we've done differently here is for the first time ever, you know, predominantly the, the airlines work very closely with forwarders. And we have been doing that, of course, but also been working very closely with manufacturers, humanitarian agencies um, and governments as well. And we've got lots of projects uh, coming up. I, mean, I was working on one specifically with an African government today. So I think it, it, it's been combining that and just making sure that all the parties in that chain understand how we actually physically can get get those vaccines to those countries and then when they reach that country, get them into the country to the people that need them. And I think that's where it, it brings in our partners. If we look at specifically, let's say DP World, DP World have a huge infrastructure of ports around the world. Within those ports, they have infrastructure as well as cold chain, as well as trucking. So, so what we're looking out for and where the DVLA can specifically help is that if there are projects that governments or humanitarian agencies have to get specific amounts of vaccines into these countries, we can work together with our partners, for example, D world um, and pick up from factory. We can then fly it to destination. DP World can then potentially store it and distribute it within country. We also have, of course, uh, Dubai airports. Dubai airports also have a huge infrastructure here um, at DXB um, where they're able to help. They've also created this vaccine corridor with Hyderabad. So there are going to be a large amount of vaccine manufacturers for specifically COVID coming up in Hyderabad and getting those distributed uh, takes not, not just air capacity, but capacity at origin, hub, and again, a destination. Of course, working also incredibly closely with the International Humanitarian City. Now, they are um, in talks and have um, partnerships with many other humanitarian agencies around the world. So they're the glue point of all of us. They have large infrastructure in Dubai, and they're also aware of all the other infrastructure around the world that we can all use as our alliance to make, to make sure, again, getting them in and, and getting them stored um, and distributed. So, so I think one of the key things from us is that it, it, it's working with different people, but then also working with um, many different types of, let's say, if you bring it out, packaging solutions. So there are many different ways you have to get these vaccines around the world, different types of packaging solutions, but also these active solutions. Um, and you need the infrastructure su to support that. And it's, it's very difficult for, there are definitely some of the uh, vaccine manufacturers we're speaking to who may have not delivered these vaccines to these specific countries before. So again, it's really working very closely with our alliance partners and with the manufacturers and our forwarding partners to make sure we work very closely together to be able to pick them up from origin and make sure they get delivered to the government site, hospital clinics where they're being administered. Thanks. I had to go off mute. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, and we'll, 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 we'll dig into some of the detail a little bit more in the Q&A. Uh, but I'd like to turn now to Abu Dhabi, uh, to the HOPE Consortium, appropriately named. And uh, I'd like to ask um, Dr. Omar Najim and Mr. Robert Sutton to make a few remarks. Dr. Omar, as I said, is the Executive Director of the Abu Dhabi Department of Health and Director of Special Programs. Uh, Department of Health's main role is to be the guardian of health in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, and he strives every day to achieve the Crown, Prince, Crown Prince's vision of a healthier Abu Dhabi. He is a member of the Gold Command Team for COVID-19 and part of the team leading on transforming healthcare in Abu Dhabi. Uh, why don't you go ahead first, Dr. Omar, and then I'll introduce Dr., uh, Mr. Sutton, and, and the two of you can go back and forth, please. Nice to have you, sir. Nice to have you too, Danny, and good to see you again. Um, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, I think I would like to start by um, saying a few things about uh, today's session and what, what does it represent. So it represents definitely the UAE position. You've got two of the major players that are representing many of the major players that exist in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and exist primarily in UAE that are transforming the way the world is collaborating and presenting 
something that we can all learn from about going getting out of this uh, pandemic today tomorrow and the and the day after so uae continued to prove itself as the main logistical hub globally uh, i think you've seen it in the news you've seen it with the different clips that different partners are are posting the amount of vaccine that went through abu dhabi and dubai uh, over the last three months to help the world getting out of this pandemic in addition to that there's many of the humanitarian efforts that uae and abu dhabi led on so just to give you some numbers so there, there's been about 250 flights going out of uh, Abu Dhabi and UAE to help the wider world during uh, the last year. These went to about 135 countries, representing almost 80% of the total humanitarian efforts that the world produced, that the world helped each other with. Now, we, we, I bring you back to, to what we're having um, today. So what the HOPE Consortium from Abu Dhabi has born out of the real challenge that we've been facing as a healthcare sector in Abu Dhabi, once we started realizing around March, April time, that vaccine is going to be one of the key factors to get out of the pandemic. We started putting together and looked at our capabilities and capacity in order to manage the logistics around the different technologies of vaccine that were being developed at the, at the time, many of which concluded into being some fantastic news within a year of some of these vaccines being produced, being manufactured, and being distributed, distributed to the world. But the thing is that there are a couple of challenges around it. One is the temperature that these vaccines and the highly specialized area, that these vaccines need, be, need to be transported, stored, and distributed uh, within. So minus 20, minus 80, are vaccines that haven't been experienced before to a large scale as we are having today. We we're expecting about 30 to 40 percent of vaccines to require that temperature band around the different steps uh, of their logistics. Now that's one challenge. We're stepping up to that challenge. It's one of the main challenges that is going to be facing humanity. Second one is the demand on that vaccine. So it's expected that about 4 billion out of the 7 billion population of Earth will be required to be vaccinated in order to all of us to uh, stamp this pandemic down. These 4 billion on average is going to require each one of them two doses. That means you need an added challenge. It needs to be done over the next two years. This presents many challenges, not only scarce technology that exists in different pockets around the world, there is the elements of 80% of the vaccination being manufactured in Europe, uh, in North America, or several other countries, while 80% of the world is living outside Europe and North America. So logistic challenge will continue to exist. Third is we need to deal with the security, with the political, with the expectations demand of the different populations around the earth that we need to serve. Now, the HOPE Consortium, what we did is we put all the best of players, not only the ones existing in Abu Dhabi, but uh, we also went beyond Abu Dhabi and beyond to UAE to look at what are the best solutions that address every single step that is involved in that logistics. You don't want vaccine to arrive at any place, being at a center or a clinic or a hospital, anywhere else, either damaged or even worse, being excursioned, uh, has some excursion out of the temperature band, leading to it not only not being effective, but also might be harmful. So every single steps around that need to be addressed in the most specialized, most effective way. And the different players in the HOPE Consortium are going to do that. So the HOPE Consortium got the Etihad Cargo, the farmer certified by AATA. You've got Abu Dhabi ports, and uh, Robert is going to speak to the numbers about the capacity and the largest capacity in the region around the three different temperature bands that we're dealing with. You've got Maqta Gateway, which is one of the key elements or differentiators about the HOPE Consortium, and the only one so far that I know that monitors where the vaccine is around the world, what's the temperature that it's, it's sleeping in, that vaccine, so you know at any one point, What's the temperature of that vaccine and is it at risk of going excursion? And what's the inventory like so you can manage it? You also got SkyCell, which is a Swiss-based container solution 
that is the best in the market. And we looked at all the available solutions around the market. Rafid with their procurement support. And we've got uh, as well, in addition to all of these, the Department of Health providing the healthcare expertise and the insurance of the quality. Uh, from point of view of somebody who's already dealing with that and been dealing with that for the last 20 years and understand exactly what the manufacturer required, what the regulatory requiring, and what the receiving end requiring. So far, we've been, we, we and along with um, uh, our uh, brothers and uh, sisters in, in Dubai, uh, been transporting millions of vaccines through Abu Dhabi and through Dubai around the world. Uh, many, I think uh, Dubai can um, speak for, for the numbers they have, but um, we have transported too many, the latest of which, let's not forget, uh, a few million vaccines that have been transported, about 10 million of which uh, last week by Etihad, and many of which to around the countries and countries in Europe and, and around the world. So all in all, is just that to, to speak to the testament. In addition to the partners, we have also the contributors. So we have about 12 freight forwarders, understanding that landing a vaccine in somebody's airport and leaving is not the ideal solution and wouldn't serve the value needed. So what we did is we partnered with 12 freight forwarders, including the likes of UPS, Agility, DHL, in order to provide last mile solutions that will deliver to the center, to the clinic and the hospitals and make the vaccines arrive at the right time with the right environment in order to make that vaccination program effective. We always say vaccine doesn't save lives, vaccination does. So whatever we do from the logistical point of view, it needs to be making the vaccination program, wherever it is, the most effective in order to get that destination out, uh, that destination out of the pandemic as quickly as possible. Um, we talked about the collaboration and I'll part with that shot. There is an acute appreciation that continued from the start day one of the pandemic all the way now. At leadership level, at frontline level, at working teams level, that collaboration is key and collaboration is not only an altruistic aim that need to be pursued, but it's also have an aim of getting everybody out of the pandemic. There is an acute appreciation that nobody is safe of this pandemic until everybody is safe of this pandemic. Robert. Dr. Omar, thank you for the, the, the overview of, 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 of soup to nuts, as we say, from the beginning to the end of the process. That's very, very helpful. Uh, we're going to turn to Robert Sutton now, who is head of logistics at Abu Dhabi Ports. Uh, at, Abu, at Abu Dhabi Ports, his primary area of responsibility is to develop and implement the port's logistics strategy and work with customers and partners to meet their business requirements and develop value-driven relationship. Robert brings more than 20, year, 20 years of experience across traditional multimodal and digital supply chains spanning the MENA region, Asia, and Europe. And Robert, we were honored earlier this week to help sponsor the visit from some of our key member companies to visit Abu Dhabi ports and to get a better appreciation firsthand of what were the opportunities to partner with you uh, on the HOPE uh, initiative. So over to you, Robert, please. Great. Thank you, Danny, and um, hi, everybody. Um, so uh, just building on uh, what Dr. Omar uh, was discussing there, when, when we looked at the supply chain challenges, um, this is something outside of our comfort zone, um, even as logisticians that have been in the business for 20 plus years. Um, the pure scale um, and complexity of moving these vaccines globally is one aspect. So we, when we looked at solutions, we, we very quickly realized no single party, regardless of size or reach or experience has the, has the silver bullet. So by pulling the different multiple geographies of, of this COVID-19 vaccine program. There were two elements to this. There were the physical supply chain, which of course we've, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about on this call. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it is the digital supply chain. So we set to work working on both elements. We have a very strong physical supply chain element. 
with a hub and spoke based out of Abu Dhabi, UAE, um, with the capacity over 120 million um, vials. So if it's five vaccines per vial, then you can multiply that by five, um, which is our static capacity at any point in time. And that covers minus 20 to 2 to 8. On top of that, we created the region's largest freezer farm, which can handle vaccines over minus 80, so ultra cold. And in that freezer farm, we built capacity of between 11 to 15 million doses. Um, and that's more than the UAE needs. And we did that for one reason. This is not a UAE solution. This is a global solution. And to Dennis's point earlier, if you look geographically, we're on the cusp of 3.6 billion people in Africa, CIS, Middle East, South Asia, GCC. Much of that territory has a fragmented cold chain. So the fact that we're able to create this hub um, on their doorstep within five hours reach of most major airports enables us to support these countries with the vaccination programs. And again, that's the physical supply chain. Around that, we wrapped a digital supply chain solution, which allows us to track vaccines from point of manufacture all the way through to administration to the patient. So if the Hope Consortium was to respond with a, a logistic solution, then it's a logistic solution. It doesn't help with the vaccination. So we took that a step further. We also deploy doctors and nurses, field hospitals, ambulances, to, to the various parts of, of the uh, world based on the request. Just in the last 24 hours, we mobilized a medical and a logistics team to some of the African states to support the vaccination program in country. So what does that mean? That means that our logistics team go there, they, they support the training, they put in place SOPs and quality programs which maintain the health of the supply chain. The nurses and the administration staff support the on the ground resources with the actual vaccination program. So by extending this service from beyond traditional logistics, beyond a movement of product, we're enabling the movement of this, not only from manufacturing, but into the arms of the patients. And that's a key differentiator. And that's one of the key value uh, propositions that we, we bring to the table. And we bring that to the table, not for the benefit of Abu Dhabi or UAE even, but for the benefit of humanity, the benefit of the communities. And that remains our focus area, is to make sure that we're able to understand that we're all in this together. And by working together, we have a solution. Robert, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna turn to the discussion section now. And again, for our listeners, if you would, uh, if you do have a question or comment, please put it in the chat function, the Q&A function. We're monitoring that carefully. Uh, I want to start with Shema and, uh, and uh, Dr. Omar. Um, uh, everyone has touched on the importance of, of what this, of these two alliances say about the UAE's global leadership. And more and more and more, the UAE is a global leader uh, today. So Shema, uh, from your perspective, say a few more words about that, about the, the UAE stepping into this role as pro of providing leadership to the world and assistance and help to the world. And you might say also a few words about the Gates Foundation and your partnership in doing that uh, with the Gates Foundation. So th thank you, Danny. Um, I, I think um, on the when we talk about the foreign assistance front for the UAE, this is not something new for us. Uh, we have been one of the top uh, top global um, uh, foreign aid donors uh, for the past few years, few decades actually. Um, we have had, um, I think. The benefit of the UAE, not only in terms of um, you know uh, our altruistic uh, approach towards the world, but we do have strong infrastructure, um, and this has been developing um, since the country's inception, 50 years. To, you know, this year is is our 50th anniversary. Um, we, the UAE has has been doing so much um, and has always been you know, giving, uh, giving to other communities. We have been collaborating at different fronts, um, multilateral level. Um, you brought a, a very good example of the Gates Foundation and 
this was a collaboration that the Crown Prince had uh, initiated with the Gates Foundation to eradicate polio, to eradicate, um, I think it started off with uh, the Carter Foundation uh, with the um, guinea worms, uh, eradicating guinea worms. And so these um, global partnerships have always been um, ongoing uh, for decades in the UAE. Again, we're a very young country, so we don't have all the necessary skills that um, can, can help us advance in, in this front. And so we always use an approach of a um, triangular cooperation to, to some degree, um, where we collaborate with different uh, expertise in developing and developed countries in order to kind of um, uh, transport um, uh, our assistance to places in need. Um, uh, Amar, do you wanna add uh, Dr. Amar? Sure, thank you, Shem. Uh, so I totally agree with um, what Shem was saying earlier. Uh, collaborations and not helping others, but it's helping ourselves as well. So it's it's about it's about getting out of this together. Uh, I think humanity over the last year uh, has given us a lot of lessons. Not only lessons in terms of the ingenuity of it, uh, and sometimes the struggle of it but also lessons in collaborations. It's been proven, and you can see all the many examples around the world. The more you collaborate around the tackling of this pandemic, the more likely you will be successful locally as well as regionally, and the more likely that the world will be successful. Um, in collaborations with the Gates Foundation, as well as many others, so the Gates Foundation, we established the global Institute for Disease Elimination, starting with um, the river blindness and now into malaria and uh, the polio as well, and will continue uh, going forward. But there are other collaborations. So there's collaborations with the WHO, there's been collaborations with uh, Gavi, with, um, uh, with COVAX uh, currently, on all understanding what will be the most value added in order to help the world uh, getting out of this. One of the two things that I would like to mention as, in, as an example, and a testament that the ethos of collaboration doesn't go just, it doesn't happen at the government level or at the state level, but it also runs in the DNA of the people living on the land of UAE. So one is we, we, we conducted one of the biggest, or actually the biggest clinical trial so 31,000 people that lives in Abu Dhabi has volunteered to take a medicine that has not proven its efficacy or safety in order to help humanity. And actually the, the campaign that enabled them to do that was called For Humanity. They understand them by doing this, they will be contributing to the expedite knowledge that will lead to the development and approval of vaccines that will get the whole world out of it that went very successfully. The second one is uh, what we're going to have in um, a three days time, which is the World Immunizations and Logistics Summit. This is going to be bringing uh, all the decision makers, leaders, uh, subject matter experts from all around the world, including the WHO Director General, UNICEF Director General, Gavi uh, uh, Board Chairman, CEO of CEPI, as well as many of the local uh, players, uh, CEOs of Novavax, CEOs of, uh, uh, of Sinopharm, CEOs of uh, Agility, all of them in one place to say, what are the challenges we're facing today that relate to the biggest question we are facing today, which is how to transport the vaccine safely and effectively and as, as fast as possible. So we're going to bring them all in a two days conference that is going to be happening on Monday and Tuesday. It's free to attend uh, and it's virtual and you will be listening to all of these guys discussing challenges, solutions and how to collaborate and take it from there. Uh, so it's a great example of collaborations, a great example of the ethos of UAE government leadership and the people. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, Shame and Dr. Omar, I want to come back to you at the end for one last question about cooperation with the UN and others on COVAX and also with the United States government. But let's just go back to our two alliances for a moment. Uh, we have about uh, 15 or, or, or so minutes left here. Um, 
the Business Council counts uh, as its members many, many key actors in the fight against COVID, uh, from our healthcare partners across the United States. Uh, key key partners like uh, Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic or or uh, uh, Chop in Philadelphia, and key key vaccine partners such as uh, and pharma companies such as Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, Merck, and Eli Lilly, and we have AbbVie and and Abbott Laboratories are all key companies that we work with. What would you tell the representatives of these companies and others that uh, want to be help want to help today? Uh, what would you tell them uh, how they can more precisely fit into your efforts or assist? Where are the, where are the touch points, if you will? And, and equal to that, what opportunities are there for our business council members to work with you more closely to hasten COVID mitigation and vaccine distribution? I'll, I'll turn it over to the Emirates team first and then uh, the, the Abu Dhabi team uh, with, uh, with Abu Dhabi ports. So go, so go ahead, Dennis or Julian, whichever one of you wanna go first in that. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that one. <clears throat> it goes actually along the lines of uh, some some of the things I was saying with regards to speaking directly, uh, specifically to the manufacturers. Um, so any of the partners, some of the ones you've mentioned, um, I'm in weekly contact with them, um, especially their well, their European counterparts from where we've been uplifting. Um, so what I would say to that is 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 we've been working very very closely with uh, manufacturers. One of the the main um, things they've been concerned about is, of course, is capacity. We know there's a huge capacity crunch at the beginning of COVID that has, you know, uh, lots and lots of airlines were grounded. As I said, we um, got our aircraft up in the air very quickly. As Dennis said, we stripped out seats of our passenger planes. So we were using all our 777-300ERs, which have fantastic um, cargo capacity. So we were very, very quick to put into capacity into the markets that needed them. So um, one of the main topics, okay, was capacity. The other one is the type of vaccine. We've we've spoken about the different temperature ranges. So so for for what 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 vaccine um, and to which packaging solution fits that specific O and D pair. So so it's 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 really being able to communicate with all the partners, but specifically to give the peace of mind to the manufacturers to make sure that we have the infrastructure and the processes um, and the capability to move these vaccines to where they need to go to. Specifically, again, using our Emirates network, which, as I said, at the beginning is over 130 destinations, but we do have incredible reach um, specifically into Africa, Middle East, Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia. We know that the US, Europe, India, China will be the biggest manufacturers. And, um, and also, if you just take that population, there's a large amount, but there are big areas uh, which will need to be uh, looked after, predominantly South America, Africa, as I said. Um, uh, Middle East and Southeast Asia. And and that, that's been said, people can see in the press um, where we've been moving these vaccines uh, so far. Julian, will you, are, do you act as a sort of a key POC, if you will, for the whole Dubai Alliance? Can, can folks on this webinar and others that see this uh, webinar be in touch with you? Uh, Absolutely. And to be and put in touch with the right people at DP World or Humanitarian City or wherever it is? Thank you. That's exactly. Fine. Yeah, yeah. That, that's not a problem. They can reach out to me. We will be putting a, a central contact center together. But all of the partners, I mean, uh, DP World um, have uh, and, and Dubai airports and, of course, Humanitarian City have all had people contacting them. Um, and then we each contact each other to see how best we can um, fit that solution. Excellent. Robert, over to you for, for Abu Dhabi response to the question. Uh, thank, thank you, Danny. So, um, I mean, very similar to Julian, we're, we're in constant contact with uh, multiple vaccine manufacturers, uh, NGOs, etc. Um, the, the, the key thing that we find is, is we need to listen. Uh, we need to listen. Be, and the reason we need to listen is because not every solution is the same. So there's an upstream, midstream and downstream uh, element that we need to understand from all of the vaccine manufacturers. Um, the current phase that we're going through is, is one of velocity, where it's, it's a matter of moving the material through the supply chain at the fastest possible route and the most direct route to market, uh, which is fine, providing that we have an equal playing field in terms of market capability to maintain the product. 
But um, as we continue to develop vaccines, as vaccines continue to be released, as scale increases, then there will be a requirement to start to build up inventory. And that's where listening to the vaccine manufacturers now and understanding their manufacturing programs and working with them on how best to maintain the supply chain velocity without compromising quality. Um, because it's, it's one thing, Danny, to move um, 2 million vaccines to Africa. But if Africa has the capability, the state in Africa has the capability to only handle 200,000 vaccines, then that vaccine grab, 1.8 million of that vaccine grab could go to waste, is at risk. So it's very important that we connect the dots between the manufacturing upstream, uh, how we move that through the supply chain in the midstream, and where we pause that across the supply chain in order to make sure we move it to the market at a rate that the market can maintain and handle. And that, that's a key part of our kind of engagement strategy is to understand that this is not a single phase move. Um, it's going to move at different phases and at different speeds, and it will require different solutions as these uh, vaccines emerge onto the market. So I think that that's the message we'd like to be able to send. Um, obviously, we do that through our own networks, but we also leverage our global partners' networks. One of the reasons why we partner with so many global freight forwarders, the top 12 global freight forwarders in the world, is because they have the local knowledge. They have the local awareness that moving a vaccine from London to Liverpool is very, very different from moving a vaccine from in across an African state. Um, and we so we leverage the international network, but we absolutely cash in on the local knowledge and expertise to protect the sanctity of the supply chain. Robert, you, you know well that I'm sure from the news that even here in the United States, we're getting, we're getting vaccine from the federal level, if you will, from the manufacturer down to the state and local level. And it's, and it's, and it's in some cases being wasted or not used in time uh, just because of these same sorts of issues. So even in a developed country like the United States, we have this problem. So one can only imagine what it might be like in the developing world and the partnership that's required with uh, you know, humanitarian organizations with, with, with the private sector to make this a success is really, really key. Um, uh, I, I just gotta have, gotta give a shout out to Etihad Airways as well, because we're featuring Emirates on the call, but Emirates, Robert, is one of your key global partners, correct? In getting the vaccine around the world, right? Um, Etihad is, is one of our global partners, yes, but they're, they're one of the global partners. We will, we're really happy to work with any partner that enables us to move back to. Of course, Etihad, we work for you on a day-to-day -day basis. You have a fantastic global network and a fantastic range of partners which extend that global network. But yeah, we're, we're very collaborative, as, as Dr. Omar pointed out. Etihad is our first choice, um, but the key thing is the solution. So there've been a, a question or two in the chat in that regard. How much are your two alliances cooperating together or coordinating or working together at this point? Or is that something that's going to develop over time here uh, in the response? Uh, Dennis, do you want to comment on that? And then back to either uh, Robert or Dr. Omar? Sure, no problem. Look, I think Danny and Robert touched on this. There is, there is, there is so much to be done. There is such a big need out there. If we just look at this geography, we talk about two to three billion people within this region to connect to so many different people. There is not sufficient capacity. I can tell you now, the HOPE Consortium and the DBLA just work very well together, in my opinion. Um, and I think so for me, it's more of a collaboration between those two entities that make this happen. Because both goals, the both missions from a UAE standpoint, is essentially how do we get these vaccines out to the people that need them most? And I think a key part, if you look at the International Humanitarian City, for example, uh, Danny, they are based bang in the middle between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And that's a real good connection, a good feed, because they are one of the largest humanitarian cities in the world that, put, that provide humanitarian aid and support and vaccines to a lot of these developing countries. So when you talk about us working together, I think it comes automatically. There is there's no question in my mind that these that the two entities work hand in hand. Our mission 
has always been is to ensure that we reach out to all those people that need these vaccines. And I think as, as it was touched on earlier, the, for the audience, the key thing here is we have that capability, we have the infrastructure in the UAE to basically support all those manufacturers, all those partners to reach these different countries and the different developing markets. So I think there's no uh, shortage out there. I think we basically have to all roll our sleeves up and basically engage and, and use the technical capabilities and expertise we have across all the dimensions in the UA. And I think the UA is just in a great position to do that, particularly for this part of the world. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Why don't I ask you to comment on that same question from, from, the, from the standpoint of Abu Dhabi Health and Dubai Health and the Ministry of uh, Health working together on this coordination process. How's that going? Uh, what can you so, say about that? I, th I think it's, uh, it's you don't need to listen to me saying you can't judge us by the outcome of what the UAE is doing in terms of responding to COVID-19. So uh, the Ministry of Health, Dubai Health Authority uh, and Abu Dhabi Department of Health uh, has been working extensively well over the last year, resulting in us featuring as a UAE in the top 10 ranking almost sustainably over the last year, being the one from Bloomberg, being the one from Deep Knowledge Group being the one uh, uh, on the uh, on the leadership uh, ranking or on the uh, people satisfaction ranking. Uh, so that continue and you can look at our testing capability and capacity that continue to be ranked number one per capita across the world or the vaccination drive that we've been achieving um, and we continue to be now we arrived at about 72 uh, people vaccinated per 100 person. But um, in terms of the logistics between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, I'll just give you again some examples. So at many times vaccines arrive in, in Dubai and they get transported to Abu Dhabi and from there get shipped somewhere else if needed and vice versa. Uh, I'll just give you another example. So in the international humanitarian city, uh, what happens is vaccine arrive from when they are getting manufactured in India or other places and they get packaged with needles and syringes, and then they get shipped to destination country. Guess where the needles and syringes are coming from? So a vaccine doesn't work unless you have a needle and a syringe to inject it into the person's shoulder. 25% of all the needles and syringes that COVAX is going to use, which is 2 billion of them, are going to be coming from one place, and that one place is called Abu Dhabi Medical Devices Company. So things get manufactured in Abu Dhabi needles and syringes, go to uh, JABS or um, a DP, they get bundled with the vaccine and they get shipped by Emirates. Uh, so us and Emirates, as well as other airlines and other similar entities are working together and open to working together in order to achieve uh, the world getting out of this pandemic as fast as possible. Dr. Omar, it's really wonderful to hear that the cooperation and the coordination uh, across the Emirates is going so well. That's so, so important. Um, Shame, I'm gonna come to you with the last question, but I do wanna highlight that uh, my team put up on the, uh, on the chat function, uh, the, uh, the website for the, uh, the, the, the summit, which is going to occur uh, in Abu Dhabi, I believe uh, Dr. Omar said next week. And we've been helping promote that as well. This is a global summit on, on vaccine distribution. And so the, the link is there for folks listening if you wanna uh, to copy that, paste it and, 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 and register to attend next week. Shema, um, this has been a fantastic discussion, which brings us back to what our mission is, the cooperation between the US and the UAE and all of these verticals. Uh, give us your thoughts on uh, this on going forward uh, between the UAE and the United Arab Emirates and the United States in this area uh, and, and how uh, with the new Biden administration in particularly, how you might see some of these some of these responses and efforts being further coordinated in the future. So um, in, in terms of collaboration with with the United States, um, uh, since I'm based in, in DC, uh, the collaboration has been actually phenomenal. And it has actually the medical healthcare sector collaboration uh, and cooperation has been expanding dramatically even, even before COVID. And so that uh, foundational establishment um, in that sector has been an extremely helpful um, 
help a way and, and pave the way for uh, for the logistics and, and kind of the knowledge sharing uh, between both countries. We have the example of Cleveland Clinic, we have collaborations and research assistance with MD Anderson, uh, there's the Children's National Medical Center in, in Washington, DC, um, emphasizing, um, you know, um, uh, advancing sciences and research in the medical field. Um, and so, whether it's the Biden administration or a different administration, our collaboration is, is more looking at the common values, um, looking at the future together. I think with the era of COVID, it has been um, emphasized even more on the importance of, of working together. Um, I think um, my job here at the embassy has been, you know, made very easy because, you know, folks like the Hope Consortium and the Dubai Alliance and other health uh, entities in the UAE have actually set the ground running for, for this. And, and all I have to do is basically talk about it. Um, and so this is just the beginning. We do a lot of collaboration. There are so many collaborations, not just in the two Emirates, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but also Sharjah and other, and other Emirates. Um, you know, we, again, we're still 50 years old. And so we do, uh, we do want that uh, knowledge and, and expertise from the United States and other countries to develop this um, uh, medical and healthcare ecosystem in, in the UAE. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure working in the sector in the UAE uh, with thanks to the United States and other countries as well. Um, but again, um, obviously uh, our relationship with the United States has been a long-standing relationship um, and even more prevalent when we when we emphasize our relationship on common values. Uh, Shema, thank you so much. And to all of the other panelists, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Omar, there's an Israeli startup that wants to get in touch with you in the uh, Q&A function. Uh, we'll copy and paste that and send it along to you. Uh, as I said, we have, we're, we're doing trilateral cooperation now a bit as well, and which is also important after the Abraham Accords. Um, We've created a medical uh, uh, healthcare task force at the Business Council, and we have some 40 members in this space right now, in this sector. We're working closely with the U.S. Embassy. We're working closely with the UAE Embassy and Dr. Bajawi on Seamus' team uh, to, to try to bring even closer and better cooperation in this incredibly important area uh, more so in the future. And uh, I encourage anyone that's listening has heard the webinar today to be in touch for more information about how you might get involved in our medical task force that we've put together. Uh, with that, uh, we have a webinar tomorrow on hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. Log in tomorrow morning if you wanna learn everything that you can about hydrogen as a new energy source for the future and what the difference between blue and green is. It's really, really important uh, as we prepare for the uh, Earth Day and the, uh, the new US uh, Earth Day Summit that's going to occur in late April. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Panelists, thank you for being on today. This has been really, really enlightening and we appreciate you all taking the time. Have a wonderful day.